Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast. As promised, there is a brand new release in the Christian Heritage series, George Herbert's The Temple, with a fantastic foreword from John Piper. Although he was a pastor of a small, remote church in Elizabethan England, George Herbert came to fame because of a small collection of poems called The Temple. In this short but beautiful collection of poetry, Herbert devised 116 new poetic forms to capture his experience of awe, sorrow, glory, turmoil, repentance, and heart-rending joy. All of it dedicated to God, not man. In this book, we have a picture of the full range of human experience and emotion, felt by a man being sanctified by God and describing it with all his poetic powers. Get George Herbert's The Temple with a foreword from John Piper today at canonpress.com. Welcome to the podcast, episode 145. The podcast, not just a podcast. This is the podcast, episode 145. So, of course, we're still in the season of COVID, and so I, I've got to talk about COVID a little bit more. Uh, one of the things I've noticed is that people don't think carefully when they're in the middle of a crisis. If you want to think during a crisis, you have to train yourself to think when you're not in crisis. You can't. You can't have your house catch on fire, and then suddenly learn all the things you should have known. There are certain things you have to prepare for beforehand. Yeah, if, if you live on the beach and you might have to save somebody from drowning, you need to learn how to swim before there's a crisis. You need to learn how to put out a fire before there's a fire. You need to learn how to think straight before there's a pressing and immediate need to think straight. And one of the things I've noticed is that people in this whole COVID thing, there's very little true intellectual argumentation. If someone says, you know, I don't think we ought to quarantine everybody. Why don't we just quarantine the rest homes or places where highly vulnerable people are and require sick people to be quarantined? Now, I'm not throwing that out as, the, uh, as a correct statement. I am simply submitting it as a preeminently debatable statement. In other words, that, that, that's not as though I've said to the world, you know, I think we should debate whether ice cream has bones and, and whether the higher they fly, the much. If I said something like that, nobody has to pay any attention to me. But if I said, you know, quarantining, might not, it might not work to quarantine the world. Why don't we quarantine the sick people and why don't we quarantine the people who are exceptionally vulnerable? That might be something that we could actually do without too much uh, of an economic cost. Why don't we try that? Now, that might be wrong. There might be good scientific medical reasons why that's wrong. Let me just grant that. I don't think it is. But let's pretend for a moment that that, that is wrong. It is still preeminently debatable. So if someone says, to, if someone responds to that, you just want people to die. <laughs> nobody, nobody wants people to die. Nobody's trying to, nobody's trying to drag this out to so the maximum number of people die. Um, uh, so if someone responds to, why don't we quarantine the vulnerable and the sick with you just want people to die, that's, a, that's an example of people playing politics. They're not reasoning. They're not debating. Okay. Or suppose I were to say, and this is another example of how unreason takes over. Suppose I were to, and you, this really is the case. You need to think about this for a minute. We have a, it's, this is being described as a pandemic, and you see people in masks everywhere. I live in Latok County, Idaho. In Latok County, Idaho, we have had five. COVID cases in the whole county, no hospitalizations, and no deaths. Okay? Five cases, no hospitalizations, 
and no deaths. And masks everywhere. Uh, and fortunately, there are a number of places where there aren't masks. But, the, you know, you go to certain places and there are masks. And this is, this is in a county where there have been five cases. And globally, over all, uh, out of everyone who's gotten the COVID-19 virus, this is a virus with a 99% survival rate. Okay? So this virus, when your, your chances of catching it in the middle of Wyoming are slim, and your chances of dying of it, if you catch it in the middle of Wyoming, are also slim. So this, this virus has a 99% survival rate. Now, let's say, and this is a good, so this is an example of, I'm setting this up as an example of how we need to learn how to think. Suppose I'm going on about this point and I'm jumping up and down. 99% survival rate. And there's only five people in Laytown County who've gotten the COVID virus and nobody's died. And what are you people doing? Okay. Now, suppose God wanted to humble me for my haughtiness or something. And the next thing that happened was that I, the pontificator on this podcast, that I myself came down with COVID. I got deathly sick. I was at death's door and then I died. Okay. So I was the one death in Latok County. Now, and here's where my illustration comes in. If to the extent that I was debating with anyone, to the extent that I was exchanging words with anyone, this would be treated with a great deal of glee on the part of uh, certain enemies who would say, see, his arrogance and his pride finally got to him, and he has been decisively, decisively refuted from the heavenlies. You know, the stars fought from their courses against Sisera, um, and that arrogant man has been struck down. Now, but here's the thing. Yeah, I, I died, and that was uh, unfortunate. That interrupted my plans. That was, that was a uh, not good thing, right? I died. But did, that, the, did the fact that I, did my argument ever say that I, Doug Wilson, am immune from COVID virus? Did I ever say that I could not possibly die from it? No. I said that 99% of the people who get it don't die. Now, if I, want, if I wound up in the 1%, does that touch my argument? No. <laughs> no, it doesn't touch my argument at all. In other words, it's, it would be used as an emotional point to yell about, but it, it would be used for sensations effect. It doesn't touch the argument. So if someone says, um, when, the, when the thing first broke, when the, when the panic first broke, there were people saying there are going to be 300,000 people dead in Seattle by this weekend. This weekend, we're going to see 300,000 people dead. Now, let's say, which turned out to be erroneous, that was false. That was hair on fire false. Okay, now let's say that there was someone over in Seattle who said, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. That's just nuts. There aren't going to be 300,000 people dead by this weekend. And let's say he was a high-profile person. Let's say he's the mayor or let's say he's the, a, a disc jockey or something. And he gets a lot of airtime saying, that's crazy. What are you talking about 300,000 people? Well, let's say that instead of 300,000 people, 10 people died by the weekend. And let's say that that disc jockey or that opponent was one of the 10. Everybody would treat it as though he was refuted, but he was correct. Now, that, that tells us that we are a relativistic people, and that means we, are, we don't care about the truth anymore. We don't care about what's actually true. We, what we, and this is the legacy of relativism. This is the legacy of our sloppy thinking over, um, over many years. Uh, is it true? Not. Did, did I, uh, was I able to score some cheap points off of it? Always we will be Martiology, episode 145. Our word this time around is atapos. Atapos, A-T-O-P-O-S. 
a tapas. The word basically refers to something that is out of place. Out of place. In the first instance, we will consider the word is paired together with wickedness. The problem, it, so when it's a problem, it's not treated as a trifle. The, so this is, we're not talking about a misplaced car keys. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 2. It says, And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. So what we have there is a tapas, uh, like out of place or disordered or disjointed or unreasonable, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked. Um, we, we can tell what kind of thing unreasonable is from the fact that it is paired together with wicked, uh, from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. And then when the two thieves who were crucified together with Jesus were talking, one of them said this, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. This man hath done nothing atop us. He's done nothing out of place. That's Luke 23, 41. Jesus, according to the thief who repented, had done nothing untoward, and nothing out of place, nothing amiss. The last use in, um, in Scripture is curious and does not refer to anything of a moral nature at all, but we can get part of our, our sense of the word. Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they'd looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. This was when Paul was gathering sticks for the fire on Malta, and then a viper came out and bit him, and he shook it off into the fire. And the people watched him closely for a while, and when they saw nothing out of the ordinary, they changed their minds and concluded that he was a god. Our book this time around is Eugenics and Other Evils by G.K. Chesterton. Eugenics and Other Evils by G.K. Chesterton. Um, one of the things that we have to realize is what a great hero of the 20th century Chesterton was, what a, what a magnificent influence he was. Uh, and here's one of the reasons. This book is one of the reasons. Um, Chesterton, Chesterton was the kind of man, he, he could be exasperating because he could fly off and say silly things uh, about this or that, uh, but he was the kind of man who would have no trouble standing up to a mob. So uh, he had no trouble uh, resisting fads, fashions. He had no trouble saying, that doesn't make any sense, no matter how many people were saying that it did make sense. So in the first part of the 20th century, when uh, science, all rise, was all the rage, uh, people wanted to, uh, they, they went in big for social engineering, and eugenics was uh, part of it. The progressives, the secularists, wanted to treat human beings as though we were a great big um, population of uh, Labrador retrievers, and they wanted to breed us, and breed us in such a way as to come up with the, the stellar man, the perfect man. And so, yeah, and you think to yourself, what could go wrong? What, what could concern about race purity? Where could that go off the rails? Well, it did go off the rails in a big way in the Second World War and in the Nazi Holocaust and uh, Hitler's concern for race, race purity and the final solution and all of that. But you have to understand that before the Second World War, before, before Hitler with his uh, genocidal ways, gave eugenics a really bad name. Prior to that time, in the run-up to the war, uh, eugenics was all the rage. In other words, eugenics, breeding people as though they were uh, prize-winning dogs or prize-winning thoroughbred horses, um, this was something that uh, all the cool kids wanted to be in on. Right. Everybody was all about eugenics. Um, in fact, um, Chesterton used to uh, debate, regularly debate his friend, uh, George Bernard Shaw, 
George Bernard Shaw was a eugenist, an advocate of eugenics. And there's a funny story. Of one, one devotee, a, a woman, wrote to um, Shaw in the interests of eugenics and, um, and proposed that they get together and make a baby. And she said, just think, it, it, the baby will have my looks and, and your brains. And he wrote back and said, well, we can't risk it, ma'am, because I might have my looks and your brain. Anyway, the whole point of treating human beings as though they were um, simply the raw material, for, as though um, this was a big, a big breeding experiment and you have superior and inferior strains and peoples and stuff like that. Well, this was the future. This was the progressive future. And Chesterton opposed it violently. Um, and this book, Eugenics and Other Evils, is a good example of how he stood against overwhelming popular opinion at the time and was vindicated by the, by the outcome of the war. And then everybody, all the, the secularists were quiet for a while. But eugenics is creeping back. Not actually, eugenics is now galloping back, not creeping back, under different names. It, it, they've had to be a lot sneakier. But they've had to be a lot sneakier because of the success that Chesterton had and the success that the, uh, the Allied forces had in fighting the Germanic commitment to eugenics, the purity of the Teutonic race, and so on. Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, was a eugenist, where she, she wanted to um, encourage the good breeds. She wanted to exterminate what she called human weeds. Um, and anybody who, anybody who looks at the century that, the, that was the 20th century, with its genocides and its concentration camps, and listen to people talk about uh, pruning the human race of its deficiencies, it ought to make our blood run cold. And we ought to be able to uh, answer it, attack it with the kind of wit and verve that Chesterton did. And if you want to know how he did that sort of thing, how he undertook that sort of thing, I commend that book to you, Eugenics and Other Evils. Mm -hmm.